again, my name is Derek from Tomcat Gas Training and welcome to this video on which is the best between power flushing and magna cleansing. But before we get into this video, please could you take some time to subscribe and don't forget to hit that notification bell because you want YouTube to tell you exactly when I'm uploading videos. It's mainly Mondays and Wednesdays. Anyway, without further ado, waffling and messing around, let's get on with it. Now, some of you will be saying, what is power flushing and magna cleansing then? Well, since British Standard 7593 was introduced in 2019, it said, basically, we cannot install a brand new boiler on a dirty system. So, uh, what do we mean by a dirty system? Well, a dirty central heating system is a system that's full of rust and magnetite. And we need to get rid of that before we can install the new boiler. So, the way we get rid of this magnetite and debris and flux and solder from floating around our central heating system, which will cause electrolysis with the dissimilar metals, which could cause corrosion. Air also causes corrosion in the central heating system. So we need to uh, combat that. So the way we can do it is in three ways. So the first way we could just use chemicals and a chemical flush to get rid of this. Number two, we could use a power flush machine to increase the velocity of the water going around the system, which could help break up the uh, magnetite and then we can flush it down the drain. Or we can use giant magnets to catch this magnetite because it is iron oxide at the end of the day and collect it with these big magnets and then dispose of the uh, magnetite. So that's what power flushing is and magna cleansing is and chemical cleaning are. It's to get our central heating systems clean before we install a new boiler. British Standard 7593-2019 also says we should be installing a magnetic filter after we've installed the boiler to continue to protect the system after the install. And we also need to install inhibitor to inhibit this magnetite coming back again, corrosion and electrolysis. So that's what magna cleansing is, and that's what power flushing is. Now let's uh, dive deeper into these two processes and find out exactly what's involved from start to finish. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give my opinion, which I think is the best way of cleaning this central heating system. Basically based on time and how efficient and how good they are to the environment. So come on then. We're getting on with it. First of all, let's find out what this magnetite sludge rusty stuff is then. So we've got two types of rust. We've got this orangey brown coloured stuff. And we've got this black horrible stuff. Now, normally this orangey stuff is what you would find in open vented systems. In f &E systems. And this could be caused by one bacteria, so if there's no lid on the system, then you could be getting this bacterial rust. Or if you pumped in the wrong location, you could be pumping over the top of the system and uh, continually putting air into the system so you get this rusty colour. So this is basically what that is. If we look at the black stuff, the sludge, which is magnetite so we know it's magnetic because when we take the big magnet and we slide it in by the time we've finished screwing it up the water has gone clear so this is caused again by corrosion but this is the copper in the system your flux and your solder and your radiators all and your brass all rattling around your system which creates electrolysis, which creates corrosion, which creates this magnetite. So when you're using a magnet cleanse, you're using a giant magnet to get rid of it, or like we say with the power flush machine, 
you're just flushing it down the drain. So that's the two different types of corrosion you'll come across. Normally in unvented systems, normally in sealed, but you can find either or in both. So uh, that's what it is then. Either way, it's corrosion. Now let's have a look at the do's and don'ts of magna cleansing and power flushing before we dive into the different sections. So number one, always check the manufacturer's instructions for the machine so you know exactly how to use it and you don't look like a lemon when you're trying to do it at the customer's property. Number two, check the type and make of the different radiators um, because there are some radiators you won't be able to magna cleanse but you can power flush or you can power flush them but you can magna cleanse them and you also need to know the condition of the rads because some of them might be in too bad a state to do either magna cleansing or power flushing and that leads me to number three the boiler type and the condition of the actual boiler so the reason why you need to know the type, is it a system boiler, is it a heat only boiler, or is it a combi boiler? You need to know what type of boiler it is, and also you need to know what type of heat exchanger it's got, because some cleaning chemicals can damage aluminium heat exchangers, say. So we need to look at the condition as well, because it might have gone too far to do any of the power flushing or magna cleansing, because you could make it worse. So that leads me to number four. What actually is the condition of the system? Is it too bad uh, of a condition to actually do things like magna cleansing or power flushing? Because remember, the actual muck might be stopping the system leaking in the first place. So number five, always make sure you take a sample of the water first. That's major important. Using your turbidity tube and checking the condition of the water to see what type of cleaning you actually need to do. Number six, so if you have got corrosion, check and see why you've got corrosion. Because if the water is like an orangey colour, that means you've got rust. Rust means you've got air ingress. So that could actually mean your pump's in the wrong position to start off with. So cleaning the system might do a short fix, but not keep it in a good condition for the rest of its life, you might need to move the pump location. Number seven, well check and see how you're going to connect the actual machine to the system. So uh, yes, like I say, we need to um, fit, or we should be fitting magnetic filters now, according to the British standards. So are we going to fit the filter first and then connect the machine to the filter? Or are we going to remove a radiator and fit the machine to the actual radiator? Number eight, whether we're magna cleansing or whether we're power flushing, we're going to be cleaning these radiators individually. So not all in one go, we can do that flush first, the first 10 minutes, we're going to be cleaning all the system, but then we're going to be cleaning every radiator individually. And then finally, number nine, when you finish the cleanse or you finish the flush, make sure the system's clean do another turbidity check and do a check with your test strips to see if you've installed enough inhibitor so that's the do's first let's have a look at the don'ts now so the first don't is don't try and power flush or magna cleanse an old galvanized steel system or a low quality copper system or that steel pipe we got in the 1970s when we had the copper shortage because you'll just end up with leaks everywhere Primatic cylinders they don't want flushing either or magna cleansing because you've got to put chemicals in the system and if you're putting the chemicals in the system then that could then get into the hot water system because remember, primatic cylinders are only separated by the bubble and we actually use the same system to fill the heating system um, as we do for the water. So, primatic cylinders, don't flush them either. And like I've been saying, don't even attempt to flush the system until you've checked the water quality. Because one, it might not be needed, and two, 
you don't know how much you're going to need to do. It could be just a chemical clean you need, or you might need to get your flushing machine out and do the full job. Now, if you're doing a vented system, you'll need to disconnect the f &E system, uh, bridge between the vent and the um, outlet, and clean out the f &E system separately. But then don't forget to put it back when you're finished, because that could be a bit dangerous, but you won't be filling the system without the f &E, would you? So if you've got an f &E system, clean it out first before you do the flush. And don't put your drain hose down the toilet. Make sure it goes down to a grid outside. Because if you put it down the toilet, one, the lid could come down and trap the hose. And two, you could fill the toilet with black sludge, which could stain the bowl and then the customer won't be too happy. So always make sure it goes down the grid. And always make sure the grid is clear first before you put the hose down there because there's nothing worse than a nice patio full of magnetite. And finally with the don'ts, don't leave it unattended. Whether you're magna cleansing or whether you're power flushing, don't ever leave the system unattended. It's always better if there's two of you doing the job as well. Makes it so much easier, one's watching the machine while the other guy's going round doing all the agitating or doing the valves or whatever, it makes it so much easier. But just don't leave it. Don't set it up, leave it running, and then go off and do another job. Because you may regret it. So that's the do's and don'ts of power flushing and magna cleansing. Now, how do we actually know we need to be power flushing or magna cleansing this central heating system? Well, before we actually started any work on this system, even technically as we were doing a quote for the job, we need to know whether the central heating system is dirty or not. So we need to check the system to make sure it is clean or it's dirty and needs cleaning. So uh, how do we do that then? Well there are five easy steps we can follow when we are doing a site survey on this installation before we can make a decision on whether it needs cleaning or not. So number one, just ask the customer, is the heating system slow to warm up? Number two, you could ask the customer or even check yourself and see whether the radiators are warm at the top or cold at the bottom or even they're all completely cold and they're not working. You could also use an infrared thermometer to test the radiator temperatures as well to make sure there isn't any cold spots. Number three, we could ask the customer when the heating system's been on ages, even with the thermostats open fully, are the rooms getting hot? Or are they staying cold all the time? Number four, again, you could ask the customer, are you bleeding your radiators all the time? Are they getting air in them constantly? Because what they'll be bleeding out is hydrogen, and hydrogen is a byproduct of the corrosion in the central heating system. And then finally, number five, we could actually carry out a water sample test. So uh, let's look at this test more closely now and find out exactly how we do it. Now the first thing we do before we touch any of the gas appliances is use our non-contact voltage indicator to make sure we've got no stray current going through the system. Now a lot of engineers get this confused with safe isolation. No, this is just safe to touch test. So we use a non-contact voltage indicator on the boiler casing to make sure that's not live so it doesn't kill us. And then we go underneath the boiler and we check all the pipework to make sure again, there's no stray current going through the pipework, which could also kill us. Because we've used a non-contact voltage indicator, we now need to prove it's still working before we actually touch the appliance. So we prove it, use it, prove it, and then we can touch it. We also need to isolate the power to the uh, supply to the boiler, and we also need to retain the fuse so nobody accidentally turns the power back on while we're working on the system. Now the first thing we're going to do is need to obviously take a water sample. So we need to get a container and we need to open one of the drains at the bottom of the rad. You could actually do it from the bleed point at the top of the radiator if you wanted to. 
but you need to take a sample. Now the first bit is, we don't want that bit, so we need to empty that out, clean out the tray, because we don't want it contaminating, and we need to take another sample, so it's not the first bit we use, it's the second sample we take. So once we've cleaned the tray out, we can now take our sample water. Now we don't need a lot, but uh, it's always better if the heating system is warm when we do this as well. So we can uh, use our test strips or chemicals if we needed to check whether there was in any inhibitor in the system or not. So that's the first thing we need to do, is collect a sample. So you can see we've got two samples of water here. Now the one on the left hand side is <laughs> a central heating system what needs flushing and cleaning. And this one here is what the water should look like. So once you've taken your sample, you can look at these two waters. So the one on the right is what it should be, but if it's like this on the left, we should be cleaning it till it looks like that on the right. Now you can quite clearly see with our samples that the one on the left doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that system needs cleaning. But there might be samples where it's a bit in between and then you need to use one of these. So this is what's called a turbidity tube. So let's find out what this turbidity tube does then. So the way this turbidity tube works, if we can see it nice and clear like that, it says we're done. If it's like that, number two, it says we need to use F1 and we're done. So if it looks like that, we need to do that. And if it looks like that, we need to do that. So this is looking down the turbidity tube with a nice clean system. So you can see the rings down at the bottom very, very clearly. So we know if we see this, no problems with this central heating system whatsoever. And we wouldn't need to magna cleanse it or power flush it. So straight away if we swap the two turbidity tubes you can see this one is the dirty one and we can't see any of the rings down at the bottom of the turbidity tube. So straight away with this uh, we will be saying it would need a flush system whether it, we were magna cleansing it or whether we were power flushing it. Even a chemical clean would not clean the water in this system. So even with me dropping the water down on the tube lower and we look down at the top, you can still not see the rings at the bottom. So uh, we will definitely be power flushing or magna cleansing this dirty heating system. Now after we've decided the system needs power flushing or magna cleansing, the first thing we'll need to do is actually drain the heating system. So I've connected a hose pipe to the lowest drain on the system, which just happens to be right near the front door. And I've run the hose pipe to the grid to drain the system. Next, I need to make sure that all the thermostatic and lock shield radiator valves are open and then open the bleed valves to every radiator on the system, starting upstairs. So we can completely drain the system of any dirty water. So if I was going to use a power flush machine on this system, so I've sheeted up in front of this radiator and I'm going to need to remove it. So the first thing I do is make sure there's no water left in this radiator before I remove it. So I'm just opening the vent to make sure it's completely drained because this is the lowest part of the system. And we're going to remove it. So I'm using these water pump pliers and adjustable spanner to undo the nut holding the radiator to the valve. So holding against I can undo the nut. Making sure that there's a bowl underneath to catch any residual water so it doesn't go all over the carpet. And I need to do this on both sides. Now both the flow and the return valves are undone. I can just lift off the radiator and uh, get it out of the way so I can connect on the power flushing machine. Now I'll need to connect the power flush machine to the flow and the return pipes so I can make a circuit 
so I can actually send the water around the flow and the return to make sure we clean the system correctly. Now the radiator has been removed I can now connect the power flush machine actually to the flow and return pipes making sure the valves are open and I've tightened on all the different hoses to the right connections on the machine itself also running a hose pipe to the drain outside. So that's how you connect up the power flush machine. Now if I was going to use the MagnaCleanse machine the first thing I'd want to do would be install the MagnaClean filter. So I'd have to make any alterations to pipe work to be able to allow me to install the filter itself. Now the valve set has been installed actually into the pipe work on the return to the boiler I can now connect up the MagnaCleanse machine. Now everything comes with this machine to connect up the hoses, um, the valves and the adapter which will connect onto the actual MagnaCleanse itself. So if we just follow these hoses here you can see exactly how I've connected it up to the existing valve set in the pipework. So on this connection will flow back to the MagnaCleanse machine and this will flow back into the system. Now this is the cleaner and this is the inhibitor. We're going to be putting the cleaner in first and then the inhibitor later. So the way we're going to put this cleaner in is through one of the magnet's pots. So this is the magnet which is going to be catching all the debris. So I'm just going to get this full bottle and I'm going to pour it straight into the uh, magnet pot. So I've isolated the two valves which feed the MagnaCleanse machine and I've pre-filled the system because I've checked for leaks. So we're going to put all this chemical into this pot. We're going to re-put in the magnet, tighten it up with the key which comes with the MagnaCleanse. So I'm just going to give them both a nip up. Now because I've pre-filled this system I can now open these two valves to allow water into the pots and the flow comes back into the MagnaClean at the bottom so I can now just bleed all the air out of these two pots so I know they're full and um, we're nearly ready for doing the MagnaCleanse so that's the air all out of the system we're now ready to start. Adding the cleaning chemicals to the power flush machine is done at a different time to that of the magna cleanse. Whereas the magna cleanse is done right at the beginning in the power flushing, you would do this after you'd flush the system a couple of times going backwards and forwards, but you still put it into the machine. Now when it comes to the radiators, magna clean give you this radiator agitator which you put into an SDS drill and you put the SDS drill on hammer. Sounds a bit weird but there you go. So we've got the radiator flow and return valves open for this radiator and we're going to agitate the bottom of the radiator. Now we only do across the bottom and we don't go across the fins because that could snap the agitator. So we just go in and go right on the bottom of the radiator and we just go across the bottom all the way along and what this will do is it will release all the magnetite which is stuck at the bottom. I guess you could do this when you're uh, power flushing but this is what you get with the magna cleanse. And if you didn't want to use the agitator you could also use the old tried and tested method of using a rubber mallet. Now as you can already see there are a few differences in connecting the system. The magna cleanse can also be connected to radiators, not just to their filter. But remember, the British standards just say now that every boiler should have a filter fitted. So why not fit the filter? Well, fit your flushing machine. You can also get adapters for other uh, magnetic filters as well, not just their own. So that's the first difference. But when you're power flushing, you're still going to be fitting a filter anyway. So you can get adapters for the power flush machine to go to filters and pumps as well. So you can actually do it through the pumps. But really, your boiler should be isolated if it's a new boiler from the system. When you're power flushing, but when you're magna cleansing, you need the boiler running. But you don't want to be contaminating your boiler. So... 
It all depends on when we're going to be doing this cleaning. I would always advise the cleaning to be done before the boilers changed. But a lot of the time in our industry we're going to the boilers and they don't work. So power flushing is good when the boiler's not working because magna cleansing needs the boiler to work. So you can see there's pros and cons for whether you're power flushing and you're magna cleansing. And then there are some guys who use magnets as well as the power flush machine when they're doing this. So they use the pump from the power flush machine to be able to pump the water around the system and then they use two big magnets again to be able to remove the magnetite. Mm. But with the power flush machine, if you're just power flushing, first of all you haven't got any heat unless you run the boiler for a short space of time to heat the water up because the cleaning chemicals don't work really well unless the water is over 40 degrees. Whereas a magna cleanse, the boiler's running up to full temperature and you can use the heat from the boiler and the chemicals to clean the system. So you can see there is pros and cons for both as we keep saying. Also, the magna cleanse is a lot quicker than power flushing because you're not dumping and refilling the water all the time. So the magna cleanse uses nowhere near as much water as a power flush machine does. So that's one of the biggest cons for a power flush machine, the wastage of the customer's water. Also, we can take the radiators off and flush them through to get rid of the, the magnetite. So there's loads of ways of doing and cleaning these systems, but we do need to do it. Last thing I want to talk about before we sum up is uh, this stuff, inhibitor. And what does it do? So there are three types of inhibitor. Not brands, types. Now the first type is cathodic. I think that's how you say it. So this connects with the hard water and salts and makes an insoluble layer. Then we have organic inhibitors, which basically binds with the metals. And then finally we've got anodic, anodic, I think that's how you say it, inhibitor, which basically makes a protective layer. So they're the three types. So basically what inhibitor does is maintains the pH levels. Because if the water's too acidic, it will again create corrosion. And what this inhibitor does is inhibits corrosion. And the chemicals are slightly different too, um, for protecting against different metals. So if you've got an aluminium heat exchanger, you want an inhibitor that protects aluminium. If you've got a stainless steel one, then you want one that protects stainless steel. But you've got different metals in your system. You've got steel, copper, brass, aluminium, stainless steel. So you've got loads of different metals what can all react. So you need to make sure you get the right brand to protect what you want. Now you can also get different test kits you can buy to actually test to see how much inhibitor you've got. And this is what we now need to do for the benchmark and the British standards every year. Now, there's no actual um, regulation to say how often you need to do this, only the benchmark says when you do your service every year, you need to be testing the, uh, the um, inhibitor levels. But when we're power flushing or magna cleansing, we need to add inhibitor and we need to make sure we're checking we've got the right amount of inhibitor, things like these. Um, Fernox test strips are amazing. They tell you there and then whether you've got enough inhibitor in. The other thing is how much inhibitor do we actually put in? Now this uh, X100, it's one litre, it will say it will do up to a hundred litres of water. Technically about ten radiators. Where this one will only do about five radiators. So depending on the radiators you've got and how much water in the system will depend upon how much you put in. 
I'm not going to go through all the tests and stuff like that because I've got three videos already on testing for inhibitor. But after we've done all our flushing, done all our cleaning, we need to inhibit the system. We need to put this stuff in to protect our system from corrosion or to help stop the system from corrosion. So make sure you do your stability test and make sure you're testing whether you've got the right amount of inhibitor using the test kits when we've completed. So let's sum up. So you can see from this video there's quite a few differences between magna cleansing and power flushing. Um, the main difference is being magna cleansing is a lot quicker than power flushing. Magna cleansing uses a lot less water than um, power flushing. It also uses the boiler heat and the boiler pump to move the chemicals around and the magnets are that big they reckon one pass will actually collect all the, the magnetite. But if your boiler isn't working and the pump's not working and it's not heating up then the power flush machine with the preheater um, to heat the water because the chemicals work a lot better when the water is actually heated over 40 degrees so it's better to try and get it up to the maximum temperature because the higher the temperature the better the chemicals work so you so there's loads of situations where you might use a, a magna cleanse or you might use a power flush machine and then we've got the guys then who put the magnets in with the power flush machine so which is my personal favourite well, my personal favourite is the Magna Cleanse machine. Um, but if the pump's not working in the boiler and the boiler's not working, then I've got to use my power flush machine connected to my Magna Clean. <laughs> so, but the actual Magna Cleanse machine, because it's a lot quicker, a lot easier to connect, because you're going to be putting or should be putting a magnetic filter in as well easier to connect to them and it's a lot cleaner and um, a lot less water is used so a lot safer for the environment and a lot cheaper for the customer as well because you're going to be there a lot less and you're going to use a lot less water so that's why I prefer my magna cleanse machine but obviously sometimes I do have to get the old power flush machine out because the boiler's already gone so, if you've liked this video, why don't you give me that thumbs up or leave a constructive comment down below. Why don't you tell me down below which one you prefer. Do you prefer the Magna Cleanse or do you prefer the Power Flush or do you use both? But if you've not subscribed to my channel then please take some time to subscribe and don't forget to hit that notification bell because we release videos mainly on Mondays and Wednesdays. All I've got left to say is, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one guys. Cheers.